I apologize, but I didn't take it that way. Okay. Um, what you call first the system or the need for it? This is one of millions of corollary questions that could be asked like that. What you call first the digestive system or the appetite? And if you have an appetite, you can't digest the food. What good does it do? And if you have a digestive system but are hungry, what good does it do? I mean, there are millions of examples like that that could be given. And I have a whole list of those kind of questions in my seminar notebook of questions for evolutionists, which I would like somebody to answer. Uh, you can get one of those on the back table. By the way, my material is not copyrighted. You can get my material if you're a type log or a skeptic and you just want to keep your money. Well, you, you, I won't loan it to you. I'll sell it to you. And after you're done, I'll write it back. You can send it back, get your money back, minus the cost of the shipping, whatever that is. So that's, that's a good deal for you there. Okay. I think those, those millions of symbiosis type systems or relationships are evidence that it could not have evolved. Thank you. It couldn't have evolved. It had to be designed. Uh, he said structure evolves Dr. directly. Dr. there's a question directed to you in okay. the next two minutes. Explain carbon dating and why it evolved. Two minutes. I have a <laughs> lot of 30 minute answer on my website. Uh, carbon dating is very fascinating. Uh, I've studied it quite a bit. I think that uh, people that really study the subject of carbon dating will say it's interesting. But there are too many problems with it. It does not work uh, very well, if at all. Carbon dating, I'll just give you a couple of examples in the two minutes here. I could explain how it works, if you like, with radiation striking nitrogen to create a carbon-14. I think once a student understands how it works, all of a sudden the mystery is gone. And uh, then they will realize, hey, this, is, this, doesn't, this doesn't work. Um, OK, just a couple of examples here. Living mollusk shells were carbon dated 2,300 years old. Oh, they're still alive. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. Shells from living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. One part of a mammoth, carbon dated 29,000 years old. Another part was 44,000. One part of baby Nemo was 40,000. Another part is 26,000. And the wood next to it is 9,000. The lower leg of a mammoth is 15,000 years old. The skin is 21,000. I think we have a problem here, folks. Uh, I, again, I can go for a long time. They had some dinosaur bones carbon dated. They dated less than 20,000 years old. They would not have even dated them had he, had he told them they were dinosaur bones. Frozen dinosaur bones were found in Alaska. There's a, uh, uh, Answers in Genesis has a book that they sell called The Great Alaskan Dinosaur Adventure. Answersingenesis.org, you can order the book, about finding frozen dinosaur bones. If they would have said they're dinosaur bones, they never would have carbon dated them because of the preconceived idea. Evolution is a great hindrance to, to thinking, to, to, to scientific uh, advancement. Carbon dating is not how they date things. They did it with the geologic dating. One last time. Time's up. Okay. Easy with all those slides. I couldn't follow the argument. Uh, the, uh, you looked at some of, they were going very fast. You looked at some of the sources, Reader's Digest. Real good scientific. <laughs> Source for these kind of data. Now, the problem with carbon dating is that, as any other kind of dating or any other kind of tech, uh, uh, scientific technique, has a certain amount of effort, comes with a certain amount of error, and scientists are aware of that error and they uh, therefore factor in whenever they estimate the age of something. The interesting thing about, about dating in general, not dating you know, men or women, but dating in the sense of dating rocks, is that there are several different independent ways of dating the same rock or material. And amazingly, they pretty much converge on the same results. You, of course, plus or minus that, that amount of error, which, is, uh, which always comes in any time you're doing empirical science. This is one of the things that is very difficult for creationists to explain. Why is it that dating things in a variety of different ways, in, using a variety of different methods, not just carbon dating, they always come up the same, and the oldest rocks come out to be billions of years old? You can't date the oldest rocks with carbon dating because carbon dating is valid only for uh, fairly recent events. Uh, carbon decays too, too rapidly, essentially, to do that. Thank you. You guys look fine. Keep in mind. Dr. Bucci, why doesn't the theory of macroevolution contradict the second law of thermodynamics? It does not. Um, no physicist, not only no biologist, but no physicist has ever claimed that the second principle of thermodynamics contradicts evolution. It certainly does not. The second principle of thermodynamics simply says that in a closed system, uh, left to itself, the amount of disorder, which is then technically known as entropy, will increase. Right? Um, the Earth and the biosphere is not a closed system. It is an open system because it receives both energy and material from outside, from the, from the sun and from the rest of the solar system. So the second principle is not violated. 
Now, probably, I'm going to create issues with that. Well, yeah, but energy by itself has never had to help anybody. If you get zapped by a, a, a lightning, which is energy, what happens if you, you don't evolve, you die? Yes, that's very cute. You accept that. It's got nothing to do with the matter at hand. The point is, the second principle of thermodynamic applies to systems that are not the living systems. Therefore, to say that the second principle of thermodynamics uh, uh, is uh, proof against evolution is simply not understanding the second principle of thermodynamics. And by the way, let me make a final comment about, about not understanding and not studying. When someone doesn't understand something because he hasn't studied that something, it's not that person is not dumb. That's not the definition of dumb by any dictionary that I know of. It's just the definition of a person who hasn't read that particular or studied that particular field. I'm extremely dumb in particle physics by that definition, simply because I haven't studied particle physics. I don't consider myself a dumb person, it's just that I haven't studied that topic. Thank you. All right, uh, if we have time, I go back and show you every slide I made on carbon dating. None of them were for Reader's Digest. So either you are misinformed or you're lying. Now, if you're being a skeptic, you don't believe there's a God, it's okay for you to lie. I believe there's a God, and I'm going to stand before someday. I'll put it back up on screen. Reader's Digest? Oh, the carbon dating? I had there from Science Magazine. What would that be? Look at the second I'll cover it in that, sir. Any fun topic at a time. Okay, you assume that adding energy will overcome the law, the second law, the second law of thermodynamics. They say the universe is a closed system, and adding energy is destructive. Folks, the universe is a closed system. Adding energy is destructive. The Japanese added lots of energy to Pearl Harbor, didn't organize a thing. We turned around and left around and added lots of energy to Japan, and didn't organize a thing with the atomic bomb. Uh, adding energy does not organize a thing. Adding energy, the sun adds energy to the earth. It destroys the roof on your house. It will eventually destroy the house. It will destroy the roof on your car. It will destroy the paint job on your car. Sunlight is destructive to everything except chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is an incredibly complex design mechanism to utilize the sunlight. So, second law of thermodynamics does apply, and evolution violates that. And if we have time, let's write two go point by point instead of these dumb rules. Um, we'll we'll time, uh, time is up. Yes. See? You may as well keep the mic, though. Pardon? You may as well keep the mic. The next keep the mic, okay. Next question to you. Doesn't it take longer than 6,000 years to form a diamond? Doesn't it take longer than 6,000 years to form a diamond? Oh, Superman does it in a few seconds. Uh, it either takes lots of time or lots of pressure. Most diamonds are found in what's called blue ground, which is in the neck of extinct volcanoes. Uh, the volcano puts an enormous amount of pressure out, asking folks to live near Mount St. Helena. Uh, blows rocks the size of this building, you know, several miles away. So I think probably diamonds were formed uh, from coal near volcanoes. That's my theory on that. I don't know that anybody knows for sure how diamonds are formed. They're certainly carbon. Uh, different crystal of carbon, like graphite and uh, uh, other forms of carbon are found on Earth. So my theory would be probably the diamonds formed at the time of the flood as the mountains of the deep were broken up and the pressure was exerted from the volcanoes uh, squirting magma through these various areas. I, I, would, I would be willing to discuss that and willing to study it. I don't know an answer, that's just my answer. It either takes lots of time or lots of pressure. I think lots of pressure would do it just as well. Okay? And I thought that Superman thing, and I expect it would um, this is amazing. This is this is the thing that, it, that is amazing about this kind of debate. Of course, you know, you realize here that you're getting short shrift by a long, by a long stretch. We're just firing things at you very rapidly. Yeah, no way to tell if we're telling proof. We know what we're talking about or something. Obviously, at least one of us doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, geologists would not be friends, but scared and listen to. <laughs>